We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag you belong at ACC as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Hey church, I'm Mark, Matt's twin brother. Just joking. I'm Matt. Uh, glad you're here. We're wrapping up a series today called Miracles. We've been going through the New Testament and specifically the gospel accounts of Jesus. And we're looking at the, the miracles that Jesus performed. On week one, right, we learned about Jesus was able to walk up to sick people and say, be healed. We got to see on week two that Jesus was able to feed the hungry by saying, be fed, right? We saw in week three that he was able to calm a storm by simply saying, be still, Last week, right, the mic drop miracle, we saw that Jesus had the power to bring people back to life, including himself, after calling it, right, he's able to say, be alive. And today, man, we've we got some trajectory going, we're going to talk about the miracle, be cursed. What? Hey, what are we doing? We're going to look at one of the oddest passages of Scripture today, one that many people struggle with, where Jesus walks up to a fig tree and seemingly has a little bit of a temper tantrum, and that's what it looks like on paper, and essentially curses the fig tree for not having any figs. What is that all about? We're going to explore that together this morning. You know, there are certain things in life that I just don't understand, I don't know about you, but I'll tell you the top two things that I don't understand. The first one is pineapples on pizza. <laughs> right? I mean, who does that? I get it. Pizza is delicious and pineapples are delicious, but that doesn't mean that you're supposed to put them together. That's just not what's supposed to happen. So I don't get that. I don't get it. Some of you are in here arguing with me right now, <laughs> but it's right. I got the microphone. Um, here's another thing. Here's another thing I don't understand is that whole concept of, of duck face when you're taking a selfie. Like, I don't understand why people think that if you put your lips out like this, that that makes you more attractive in a photo. I just don't get it. It doesn't. Stop it, right? Stop it. But another one of those things that are really hard to understand is what's going on in Jesus' mind when he walks up to a fig tree and curses it. It's one of those really weird things. It seems like Jesus is acting outside of his character. It seems like he's being irrational, vindictive, even mean, spirited. Like, what is that all about? And sometimes when we read this passage in Mark 11, we just kind of read past it quickly because it's uncomfortable. What is that all about? Why is Jesus cursing fig trees? And so what I want to do is read this passage with you. I'm going to make four observations and then tie them all together with a bow, a, a kind of a big idea that hopefully we can walk away with. So if you have a copy of God's Word, I hope that you do. Open it up to Mark chapter 11. If you don't own a copy of God's Word, uh, we're going to change that right now. Just reach under the chair in front of you, grab that Bible, write your name in it, take it home with you. Uh, we will put another one there for next service, all right? So just grab that Bible and take it with you. Mark chapter 11. Uh, we're going to start in verse 12, but understand in this verse that you're reading, it says the next morning. The next morning after what, okay? So this is the right after, this is during the Holy Week where Jesus has gone through that triumphant entry into Jerusalem, all the Palm Sunday. Remember, everyone's shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna. They're all excited. He walks into Jerusalem. Well, that night to get some rest, he leaves Jerusalem and goes into Bethany with his disciples to, to sleep. All right, and so it says this. It says in verse 12, the next morning as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. So this brings up my very first observation that I think we should grab from this passage. It's this, that Jesus was 100% man. 
When Jesus was walking on the face of this earth, it's important to understand that this passage emphasizes the humanity of Jesus. It shows you that Jesus was hungry. I think we could even go so far in this passage to say he was hangry. You've probably heard that phrase before. He was really hungry. And it's important to recognize that he was hungry. And in fact, when you look through scripture, you can see how the humanity of Jesus during his time on this earth is emphasized. We see that Jesus gets tired. We see that Jesus gets sad. We see that a lot of the emotions that you and I feel, the things that we experience, the things and thoughts that go through our heads, these are similar to Jesus's experience. And here he is, and he's hungry. He's hungry. You think about that. We've all been there before. It's uh, one of the reasons, I don't know if you've ever wondered, why do we call breakfast breakfast? It's because you went through a whole evening of sleep, of fasting, no eating, and then you break that fast first thing in the morning. And so Jesus wakes up and he's ready to break his fast and he's hungry, just like you and I would be. So Jesus, we see his humanity here, 100% man. And then the verse goes on in verse 13. It says that Jesus noticed a fig tree in full leaf. Say those two words with me. Full leaf. Like, what is that about? We'll talk about it in a second. He saw a fig tree in full leaf a little way off, so he went over to see if he could find any figs. But there were only leaves, because it was too early in the season for fruit. So we want to understand this verse before we read past it. And so what I want to do is walk you all through what I would call fig tree fruit bearing 101, all right? So the cycle of a fig tree, it's important for us to understand. We understand that the Passover and the, the, the Easter, the, the crucifixion that Jesus was about to walk into, all that was, you know, springtime stuff. And so to understand how the, this, this fig tree season would work, from mid-August to mid-October was fig harvesting season. It's when you would go up to a fig tree and expect it to have figs that were ready to be pulled and enjoyed, all right? So it's not mid-August to mid-October. This is the wrong season to find ripe figs on a fig tree. But there's another thing about this season is that once that the harvesting season was over, the tree would get these little uh, little knob type things through the winter, these little buds. And then when the winter would turn into spring, these little buds would turn into what's called early figs. Another word for that is pagim, P-A-G-G-I-M. Say pagim with me, pagim. So, so a fig tree would grow pagim. And it's important to understand the way a fig tree works is that it will grow pagim, early figs, before it would grow leaves. So once a tree is in full leaf, once there's leaves growing on the tree, you expect that there's already going to be early figs growing on the tree as well. Now you and I, if we went to the Middle East and we saw some pagim and we ate it, it, would, it, would, it wouldn't taste good for anybody, but it would actually probably make us a little sick. But if you grew up in that area, if you were native to that region, you could actually eat pagim if you were desperate enough If you are hungry enough, it's not going to be sweet. It's not going to be delicious. It's not going to be like a Fig Newton, right? It's going to be a little bitter and gross, but it will provide you some sustenance. And so Jesus goes up to this tree in full leaf, and he's expecting something to be able to eat. He's essentially hungry. If you so hungry that he's willing to eat bad food. Have you ever been hungry enough that you're willing to eat bad food? In Micah 7... Verse 1, I see this verse about early figs. It says this, How miserable I am. I feel like the fruit picker after the harvest who can find nothing to eat, not a cluster of grapes or a single early fig, not a single pegim can be found to satisfy my hunger. So what we see in this passage is this miserable hunger, this this aching hunger that's so miserable that you're willing to go and just find an early fig and eat that instead just to try to satisfy your hunger. Well, Jesus is willing to eat even bad food to satisfy his hunger. Imagine this for a moment. You just landed, you flew into Texas, all right? And Texas is unique in that when you get out of the airport, you're going to have two options, all right? You can go to Whataburger 
Or you can go to In-N-Out Burger. All right? So imagine if you're in this scenario and you're hungry in this moment and you just found out that In-N-Out Burger is closed for renovations. I know. You guys are feeling this with me. In that situation, you might be hungry enough that you, you're going to go eat a Whataburger. You're willing to go to some bad food because good food is not available. So I'm painting the picture for you all. You got it? All right, so that, that's, that's what's happening here. Jesus sees a tree in full leaf. He's expecting to be able to go up and eat even some bad food just to satisfy his hunger, to break his fast. And there is nothing there. It's safe to say Jesus was really hungry. In fact, often used, we use the word hangry, right? You're, you're hungry enough that bring other feelings along with it. And so Jesus goes up to this tree and he finds only leaves. In other words, the tree showed outward signs of, of being a fruit-bearing tree. It showed uh, all the things that it was supposed to show, full leaf. It's, I mean, you should be able to go up to this tree now and see some early fruit growing on it, but there was none. It was the wrong season for fruit, according to Scripture, but it was the right season for pegim. In other words, this tree was barren. It wasn't a fruit-producing tree. Have you ever heard the phrase, maybe in, in your dating time, if you, those of you who remember, used to, maybe when you were dating, there, there was this phrase, uh, good from far, but far from good. Anybody know what I'm talking about? This is when you maybe would see someone far away, and you're like, wow, man, she looks really beautiful. And then you get up close, and you're like, oh, okay, never mind, Woo. <laughs> That's good from far, but far from good. That's what that phrase means, all right? In fact, I remember the first time I met my wife. Bear with me. Hold on. <laughs> bear with me. Bear with me. I'm going to redeem this, okay? I was in a, a cafeteria in college, first week of freshman year. And it's a pretty big cafeteria. And my wife, we'd never met before. I didn't know her name. She walks in on the other side of the cafeteria. I still remember what she was wearing. And I remember vividly saying to my dorm mates who I'd just met, like, do you see that girl over there? One day I'm going to marry that girl. I called it right then. She was good from far. Now here's the great thing. She was even better up close, all right? <laughs> even better, all right? See how that works. You had to bear with me. But sometimes there, 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 there's this situation of Jesus sees this tree and it's full leaf. It looks like something that he's going to be able to go up to it. And he's going to find pegim. He's going to be able to find something. It's not great food, but it's going to be something to satisfy his hunger. And he walks up to it and sees that there's nothing but leaves. That's an interesting thing to understand as we read this next verse. Verse 14 it says, then Jesus said to the tree, may no one ever eat your fruit again. And the disciples heard him say it. In other words, your version of, your translation of scripture might say something like, he essentially cursed the fig tree. He, he, he basically killed the fruit tree with his voice. Which leads me to my second observation this morning, that Jesus is 100% God. Not only was, was he 100% man in that moment, but in that exact same moment, he was 100% God. He remains 100% God today. And in that moment, we can see his deity. Not only was he hungry, but now we see his deity brought into the picture as he looks at a tree and with his voice kills it on the spot. It's pretty powerful. I don't think I could pull that off. I, I don't. It, I struggled to, to, I've never had an experience where I've, I've cursed a tree and watched it wither and die. Jesus is showing off his power and his deity. Now, some of us would look at this verse and say, well, really, he's just acting like a child. He's just hangry, right? He's, he's not acting in his character. He, he goes up and he's hungry and there's nothing in this tree, so he just curses it. What's that all about? Why does Jesus do that? And so let me point out two more observations, okay? Here's the next observation, is that this fig tree is a powerful symbol of God's judgment on pretenders. I want you to remember that since Jesus is both man and God, 
he's able to, to look at this situation and make a very important point for us today. You see, ultimately what Jesus was doing in that moment, and he knew he said it out loud so his disciples would hear it, so that it would be written down in scripture, so that we would read it today. Jesus is pointing to the spiritual state of the, Jew, uh, of the Jewish people of that day. He's saying, listen, remember those people that just yesterday or two days ago were, were, were all excited as I was walking into Jerusalem? They're all shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, we love you, you're awesome, you're, you're our guy. Remember those people? The, they look like they're full leaf, they're, they're healthy, they're, they're growing, they look mature, they look like they're bearing fruit. Well, there's nothing there. You're about to see that. And so Jesus is making this statement about the state of the heart of the people of Israel, but he's also making that statement about all of us for us to consider today, because here we are, it's recorded in God's word. Why did he include this story of this fig tree? It's because you and I need to understand that this fig tree is a powerful symbol of God's judgment on pretenders. You might be thinking, what, what do you mean by pretenders? You see, there are many people in this room right now, many people in this world right now, who claim to be followers of Christ. They'll tell you with their mouth, I love Jesus. And if you look at them from social media, you look at them from the outside looking in, they look good from far. All sorts of green leaves. But here's, here's an example in Luke 13, I'll put it on the, the screen for you about people who claim to be Christians, some will say this. It says, then you will say, but we ate and drink with you, and we taught, and you taught in our streets. And then he will reply, I tell you, I don't know you or where you come from. Get away from me, all you who do evil. There's a similar and more well-known passage in Matthew where Jesus says, I never knew you. I don't know about you, but if you're in this room right now, I'll, I'll put myself in this too, right? I believe that I am a follower of Christ. I believe that one day I will be standing before God and God will look at me and say, I know you. You're Matt. I know you. We have a relationship. And I believe there's others of you in this room right now. You also believe that you are a follower of Christ. And you believe one day you're going to be standing before God and he's going to say, I know you. But then you read a passage like this in Luke and this one in Matthew, and it says one day some of us who think that we're followers of Christ are going to stand before Jesus, and he's going to be like, get away from me. I don't know who you are. Man, shouldn't that at least cause us to pause for a minute and think through our faith, think through our life, the choices we make and the fruit that we're bearing, and like really kind of ask, like, what is, what's going on? It's a powerful reminder of God's judgment on pretenders. And it ought to make us think, am I a pretender or am I for real? You see, all over the Old Testament, God uses figs and fig trees as a symbol for his judgment on people who aren't real. And Isaiah, I'll, I'll read four of these for you real quick. Isaiah 34 Verse 4 says, The stars will fall from the sky like withered leaves from a grapevine or shriveled figs from a fig tree. Again, this is a verse about his judgment. Jeremiah 29, 17 says, This is what the Lord of heaven's army says. I will send war, famine, and disease upon them and make them like bad figs too rotten to eat. Again, this is another verse about God's judgment. Hosea 2 12 says this, I will destroy her grapevines and figs, then a thing she claims her lovers gave her. I will let them grow into tangled thickets where only wild animals will eat the fruit. Again, another verse about figs pointing to God's judgment. Joel 1 7 says this, it has destroyed my grapevines and ruined my fig trees, stripping their bark and destroying it, leaving their branches white and bare. So here's, here's my point in bringing all this up. 
It seems like God brings up fig trees often. In the Old Testament, we see this concept of a fig tree kind of being, if in a way, a popular uh, symbol that, that God uses. It's kind of like his shtick, right? He, he has this thing that he keeps referring to, and it seems to always point to God's judgment on pretenders. Pastors, you'll, you'll notice that we all kind of have uh, go-to illustrations. You, you'll know that you can't sit in here for, for a month and not hear the words in and out burger come out of my mouth, right? It's just kind of something, right? Or you, you, many, many of you probably know I don't like cats all that much, right? I'm making enemies in here, I know. But listen, God's kind of go-to illustration, it seems, when he's talking about bringing judgment upon those who look really good from the outside but aren't actually bearing any fruit, is this concept of figs and fig trees. So Jesus walks up to this fig tree very intentionally and curses it, not because he's throwing a temper tantrum, but because he wants us to know that many of us in this room right now, we walk around acting like everything's great. We're acting like we got it all together. We know how to dress for a Sunday morning. We know all the right words to speak when we're talking to the right people. We know all the right things to say and do. And we look like we're in love with Jesus. But really, we just have a lot of green leaves and no fruit to show for it. And so Jesus is providing this illustration to us. You see, some people claim to be Christians They look good on the outside, but in Jesus' own words, they're really like whitewashed tombs. He's picking on this fig tree to teach us an important lesson. Here's observation number four, is that you can't pretend with Jesus. You can try and get away with it for quite a while pretending with other people. All right, you can go up to your coworkers and your family and your friends, and you can act like you got it all together, and you can probably pull off that charade for quite a while. But when it comes to Jesus, you can't hide. I wrote down, you can pretend with men, but not with him. You see, you'll notice there's a reason why immature Christians don't want to let other people get too close. Because they know they look good from far, but they know that they're far from good. There's a reason why immature Christians would say, listen, I'm fine with coming into a Sunday morning experience where a thousand people are gonna come in and out of these doors on a Sunday morning because I can look good from far. But boy, don't put me in a life group with 25 people and ask me to be vulnerable. Ooh. I, I, listen, I, I'd rather keep my sins private. I don't want to, I want other people to see that my leaves are just green leaves with no fruit. Uh, I, I'm not going to confess my sin to a brother or sister in Christ. That's letting them get a little too close. But see, the truth is we reject life groups, we reject discipleship, we reject confession, we reject these things that let other people in because of, the truth is we have all these green leaves, but there's no fruit there. So we see if we skip to verse 20 in Mark 11. So now Jesus has gone past the fig tree, he's cursed it, and then the next day they're walking back by this fig tree. And it says the next morning as they passed by the fig tree he had cursed, the disciples noticed it had withered from the roots up. Say those two words with me, roots up. Ready? Roots up. That's going to be important in just a moment. It says, Peter remembered what Jesus had said to the tree on the previous day and exclaimed, look, Rabbi, the fig tree you cursed has withered and died. When I read this passage and it says that it had withered from the roots up, what that really is a picture of is that a tree that withers from the ground up means it can hang on to some green leaves until the very end, it can look really, really great from the outside looking in. I can't tell you how many times people come into a pastor's office 
in need of, of emergency counseling. They're in a, a state of, of, of just dire emergency. And in that moment, I would have said just two days later that everything in their life was great. On the outside looking in, their marriage seemed strong. Their, their, uh, their relationship with Jesus looked great. I would have just told you, man, I, I had no idea this was happening because what was happening the whole time is months ago, their roots started withering. And then uh, their, their leaves were still green. And then their trunk started withering. But boy, their leaves still look green. You go into social media and then you'd say, man, this is the strongest marriage I've ever seen. And then what happens at the very end is there's a point at which you can't keep up the facade anymore. The strayed ends and even those leaves can't hang on. The tree withers all the way from the roots, all the way out to the leaves. And now they're walking into a pastor's office and everything's already dead. Like, why couldn't we have talked about this months ago? When the roots started withering, why couldn't you have been vulnerable and, and open and honest and maybe that it would, we would have had an easier time saving this? Now, don't get me wrong. Jesus is a miracle worker. He can take even a dead tree and bring it back to life, Okay. But the truth is that the pattern many of us go through is that we wither from the roots up and we keep this facade as long as we can. When then the truth is there's really no fruit. It just looks good from far away. At some point, you can't keep up the facade, but the truth is that Jesus already knows what's going on in your life. That was kind of your observation number four. You can't pretend with Jesus so when we look at uh, uh, another verse, when I say Jesus already knows the truth, John 15 says this. Jesus says, I am the true grapevine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit. He prunes the branches that do bear fruit so that they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine, and you are the branches. Those who remain in me, and I in them, will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. That's a powerful promise right there. What it's saying is that you can't pretend with God. He already knows whether or not you are a fruit-bearing branch or not. He knows exactly what's going on, and he prunes the tree. And those that are bearing fruit, he, he, he helps you. He prunes and actually makes it so you can actually grow more fruit. And those that aren't, he cuts off and throws in a fire to be burned. Don't miss the significance of that passage what Jesus is pointing out by cursing this fig tree. You see, since Jesus is both, at that time was both man and God, 100% man, 100% God at the same time, he knows the truth and he's warning each and every one of us not to be fruitless. All right, so here's the big idea. I promised four observations and then tie them all together with a bow. Here's your big idea. It's this. When you stay connected to our miracle-working Savior, we're talking about the be-fed Savior, the be-healed Savior, the be-still Savior, the be-alive Savior, the Jesus that can do all these things. When you stay connected to that Savior, he can do miraculous things through you. You're like, well, that's not what this fig tree thing said at all. Well, if you keep reading in Mark 11... Remember, Peter just pointed out that the fig tree has withered and died. And he's like, whoa, Jesus, look, here's that fig tree you were talking to the other, the other day. You told it to, to never produce fruit again, and now we're walking by it, and the whole thing is dead. And then Jesus says this in verse 22. It says, and Jesus said to his disciples, have faith in God. I tell you the truth. You can say to this mountain, may you be lifted up and thrown into the sea, and it will happen. But you must really believe it will happen and have no doubt in your heart. I tell you, you can pray for anything. And if you believe that you've received it, it will be yours. That's scripture right there. 
Jesus is saying, you think it's pretty cool that I was able to speak to this fig tree and kill it, but I want you to understand that the miracle working God that I am, and when you stay connected to me, when you stay, uh, when you are bearing fruit and not just pretending, when you go through life the way I've designed for you to go through life, I can do miraculous things through you. I can change the world through you. Jesus is saying, if you stay connected to me, there's nothing you can't do. Really what he's saying is, you stay connected to me, there's nothing I can't do through you. You probably noticed the graphic that we're using for this series, right? I'll get out of the way, but you see this man standing on the ground, and he's looking up at a mountain that is floating in the sky. And it comes from a passage like this, when it says, listen, if you have faith, if you believe and you trust, there's nothing you can't do. You could speak to a mountain, and it'll move. You know, there's a story I'm going to give you the, the real quick version of it. You can go look it up for yourself, Wikipedia, these people and these places and this time. But in 979 AD, in the Coptic church, right? I'm just going to call it the Egyptian Orthodox Church. So in Egypt, there was a, a Christian church that was planted uh, essentially by Mark. The Mark who's writing all these, you know, chapter 11 that we just, that Mark uh, started a church in Egypt. So this Egyptian Orthodox Church was there. Well, at the time, in 979 AD, there was a, the, the kings of this area of Egypt, were these, they were called caliphs. They were Islamic kings. So the church was persecuted mercilessly. And the one king at the time, uh, one of the ways he liked to be entertained was he'd bring people together to debate hot button issues. And he would listen to the debate. He'd bring the best and the brightest in front of him and say, debate this topic. And at 979 AD, he brought in a Christian from the Egyptian Orthodox Church, and he brought in a Jewish believer, and he says, listen, I want you guys seem to have a big difference of opinion in uh, this whole Bible thing, so I want you to debate in front of me. Remember, an Islamic caliph, king. And so they're debating and as they're debating, the, the Jewish believer brings up this, this point and essentially says, well, well, to the Christian, well, you have this old, or this New Testament, and this New Testament, it actually claims that if you have enough faith that you can move a mountain. And so the caliph says, hmm, that's really interesting. In fact, I challenge you, Christians, I'm going to give you three days to have enough faith to move a mountain. And at the end of three days, you'll have four options. One, you can move a mountain with your faith. Number two, you can convert to Islam. Number three, you can get out of Egypt. Or number four, I'll kill you on the spot. Those are your options, three days. And so the Egyptian Orthodox Church, the Christian church, they're sitting there thinking, what should we do? And, and so the, the leader of the Egyptian Orthodox Church has a vision that night from God and says, listen, I want you to go at four o'clock in the morning and you'll find a man carrying water. And his name, he doesn't give him the name, but we, we later learn that he goes out at 4 a.m. and he finds a man carrying water and his name is Simon the Tanner. And, and the, God tells this leader of the church, when you find him, this man is the one man in Egypt that has enough faith that he can move a mountain. And so they find Simon, and they tell Simon the predicament they're in. And Simon says, listen, I'll, I'll, I'll come, but I, I need everyone to fast. I need everyone to connect to the vine. I need all the Christians to, to gather. For these next three days, we all need to make sure that we know that only God has the power to move a mountain. He can do it through our faith. And so Simon agrees to do it. He, he says, as long as you promise not to tell anyone that, that it was me that you came, that God sent you to me, and until after my death, I want to remain anonymous. And so they do this. They fast and they pray for three days and they gather together. The Christians are there. The Jewish people are there. Uh, the, the Islamic king and all his followers are there and they're all gathered and they're watching this whole thing go down and they're bowing and they're praying and they say this thing like 40 times and then finally Simon the Tanner, he bows down and as he stands up, you go read this for yourself. The mountain lifts from the ground high enough that you can see the sun shine between the mountain and the ground. 
I hear a story like this. I'm like, wait, what? Faith enough to move a mountain. The history books show that this caliph in that moment was so moved by what he just saw, he declared in that moment that Christians would no longer be persecuted under his rule. See, here's the point, is that when we stay connected to the vine, when we stay connected to God, when we're not just a tree with leaves that look good, but when we're actually a tree, maybe even you got figs, you got some pegim, you got some early figs, but the leaves aren't even there yet. God knows the difference. He knows whether or not you're bearing fruit or not. In fact, for our what now, I, I, I want to ask you to ask this question to God. God, what do you want me to do with this? What do I do with the Jesus He's able to heal the sick? He's able to feed the hungry. He's able to calm storms. He's able to bring himself back to life. What do I do with this Jesus who's created this powerful symbol for us by cursing a fig tree? And here it is. Maybe you've asked the question before. How do I know if I'm one of those Christians who will one day be looked at by God? I know you or I don't know you. How do I know the difference? Where do I fit into that? And here's the answer. True believers bear fruit. Say that with me. True believers bear fruit. That's the way you're going to know. That's the way you're going to know. There's, there's a a quote by Martin Luther I want to read to you. And it says this, We are saved by faith alone, but the faith that saves is never alone. I want you to think about that for a moment. We are saved by faith, all right? There's no work you can do that's going to earn God's good grace in your life. The only way you get saved is by putting your faith in Jesus. That's it, all right? But the faith that saves... Uh, Though you're saved by faith alone, the faith that saves is never alone. You're going to see that as you put your faith in Jesus, that it's going to come with it fruit. There's going to be fruit that comes out of your life. You're going to be changed. You're going to be transformed into the likeness of Christ. Listen, you're not going to get baptized and then walk up out of the water like Jesus. You're going to have some work to do. There's There's a process of becoming more and more like Christ. Whatever you did wrong today, you're going to find that tomorrow you're working at repentance and your heart was broken by it and you're going to try to do better and you're going to see transformation happening in your life. You're going to see fruit. You might think, well, what does that fruit look like? Well, one of the types of fruit you're going to see is the fruit of repentance. When you break God's heart, it's going to start to break your heart. And you're going to say, man, I don't know why I did that. That was dumb. God, please forgive me. I don't want to do that again. And when you do it again, you're going to say, why did I do that again? It breaks my heart. God, help me to do that less. Help me not to do that again. You're going to be repentant. Another fruit we're going to see is we're going to grow in Christ-likeness. We're going to notice that we become more and more like Christ. We're going to see humility and patience and love and self-control and list all those fruits of the Spirit. Those are fruits we're going to see in our life if we're connected to the Father. Another fruit, this one's really important. When you are connected to the Father, you're going to fall more and more in love with God's Word. If you don't love God's Word, you don't care to spend time in it, it's not special to you, I would say you're not bearing any fruit. Because God's written you a love letter and you don't want to spend any time reading it. We look at these things we call our five catalysts around Arundel Christian Church. Five things that we say help people grow into Christ-likeness. A real simple one is attending corporate worship regularly. Worshiping regularly. I would say, listen, if you don't have a desire to gather with other Christians on a regular basis to worship God, that's a sign of a barren fig tree. What about connecting relationally? If you'd rather do life from afar away and, and you don't want to connect with other believers in a more intimate way, being vulnerable, allowing them to, to hear your, your confessions of sin and, and to pour into your life and to help you walk through things, well, that's probably a sign that maybe you are lacking some fruit in that area. What about in the area of growing personally? If you're not spending time in God's word, I would say, listen, if you're not pouring into your own life by spending time with God, that's evidence of a barren fig tree. If you, what about serving regularly, right? If you're, I like to come into church, I like to be served, and then I like to go away. 
but I have no desire to use my gifts and talents to serve and, and, and fulfill the Great Commission. I would say that's evidence of a barren fig tree. What about giving generously? Like, hey, you know what? What I have is mine. I don't like to share it. I don't want God to use what I have to, to help advance his kingdom. I would say that that's a heart that comes from a place of a barren fig tree. And so here's my point. True believers bear fruit. And you ought to be asking yourself, what do I need to do to be a fruit-bearing tree? To catch this before the roots wither and then the stump withers. And before you know it, I'm sitting there with not even leaves to hang on to. And I'm just laid bare before God saying, I was faking it. Let's pray. Father, I pray right now that you would allow this church to be a church of fruit-bearing real followers of Christ. That we'd be a church of people who love you genuinely, that we long to spend time with you. We long to be transformed by you. We want to become more like you. So we spend time learning how to become more like you. We spend time with other people who are like you so that we can be transformed and released by the love of Jesus. God, I pray that anyone in this room right now that doesn't have that fruit in their life, they don't have any evidence, outward sign of, of fruit, they're just faking it. God, I pray that you would give them the, the wisdom right now to, to recognize that's where they're at. You'd give them the courage to do something about it right away. To tell someone, to tell a pastor, to tell one of our hosts, to tell a family member, listen, I need to take some real steps of faith. I'm tired of faking it that we'd be a church of, of genuine, fruit-bearing fig trees. God, we love you, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings. Please remember this. You belong at ACC.